Okay, good morning. Let's begin. The Shabbos is a two partial. Once again, we have the fusion of two partial. So it's Bahar and Bukukotai. Let's begin with, of course, the first parsha, Bahar. We'll do a, the first three aliyot. That's what the concern of this year will be, namely Shemitah and Yovel, and understanding these fascinating two halachot that to a certain degree certainly apply in Eretz Israel, less so to our lives by being a chutz laaretz. But we all know that in Eretz, by being in Eretz Israel, it does have implications. So, okay. Okay, so what, what do you have to say? Nothing. Excuse me, could everybody mute themselves? Oh, gosh. I... Okay. One second, I mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So let's begin. Let's just get our feet wet in the psukim. Hashem spoke to Moshe Bahar Sinai. Hashem says to Bnei Israel, when you come into the land I will, that I will give you, you will observe a Shabbos of the land, right? Shabbos, and rest for Hashem. What does that mean? Six years you will plow your field, and you will deal with your vineyards. You will gather in your craft. On the seventh year, Shabbat, 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 there will be a Shabbat to the land. So the Cholot Yisrael, the Charm Cholot Yisrael, you shall not harv, you shall not sow, nor your, you shall not sow, and your vineyard you shall not prune. Esfiyat Kitzir Cholot Yisrael, the Sin Bein Nizir Cholot Yisrael, Shabbat Shabbat Son Yisrael Laaretz, the aftergrowth of your harvest you shall not reap, and the grapes that you have set aside for yourself you shall not pick. There will be a year of rest of the land. And not to work the land. The Shabbos produce of the land shall be yours to eat for you, for your slave, and for your maidservant, and for your laborer, and for your resident who will dwell in the land as well. And for your animal and for the beast that is in your land, shall all its crop be eaten. It's, that's the land will be open to everybody to eat. Visafarto now continues. Visafarto lecho sheva shabbato shanim sheva shanim sheva kamim, and you're going to do something else. You shall count for yourself seven cycles of seven shmitot. Seven years, seven times. So you're going to get 49 years, right? The years of the seven cycles of the sabbatical year shall be 49 years for you. When that happens, you will blow a shofar. On the, um, the seventh month, the tenth of the month, which is Yom HaKippur, and you shall blow a shofar in the land. Of course, that announces what? Yovel. And you shall sanctify the 50th year and you'll proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants, right? Very famous words. Is on some bell in Philadelphia. Correct? It has a crack in it. Okay. Yovel, he shall be a jubilee, um, the jubilee year of and you're to return to your ancestral land. So if you sold your land previous before the 50th year, on the 50th year, um, not only do you make the land rest, so it's two Shemitah years back to back, it's the 49th and the 50th, but everybody goes back to their land. So if you sold a piece of land in Eretz Israel, it goes back to the owner, to the original owner. And Yovel is another Shemitah year. You're not to plow, you're not to reap, you're not to plant, etc. Because it is a Yovel and it will be holy to you. So again, it repeats that on the Yovel, you're to return to your land. 
the chisim kumim kon la misecha o kono miyada misecha o tonu esh tzochim no a new halacha pasuk yudale when you make a sale for you to your fellow or you make a purchase from the hand of your fellow do not agree do not own up do not agree we're not going to get into ona the rav didn't really discuss this but on um in his parish on the chumash but on not to ish ish as a chiv you're not to do onas onas mamon means you're not allowed to what it really means is you're not allowed to overcharge with the other person not realizing it right it's taking advantage of the person not only that you're to calculate the years of till the jubilee that in other words if you're here it's a 49 year time if you sell the land on the first year of the next cycle the land deserves to be sold at a higher price because the person gets 49 years of use because remember what happens on Yodel. It goes back. If it's 30 years, it's going to be less. If it's 20 years, it's going to be, that's what the Torah is telling you. You calculate according to the amount of years that you still have until Yodel. Can you spar to those who mocher moch? Exactly what I told you. And then it repeats. So the Chazal debate, what, what was the first Ona, what's the first, the, the second Ona? There's Ona's Devarim and those Ona's Mamon. One is not to afflict another person with words. For God says, don't do that. I am God. You shall perform my decrees and observe my ordinances and perform them, and you shall dwell with, with, with uh, security in the land. Okay, that's a quick, just getting our feet wet in this idea of Shemitah and Yovel. What in the world is going on? What are the laws of Shemitah and Yovel all about? And the Rav approached the Rishon and Shani through Sushlishi and Parshas Bahar with one intent, to understand the message of, Ye of Shemitah and Yovel. What is the real message? Okay, you're not allowed to plant. Okay, you're not allowed to work in the land. What is this? And there's something else. If you paid close attention, your ears heard it. That is, what is Shemitah called? Ashnas Shabbaton. Shabbos keeps on repeating and repeating and repeating, right? That word Shabbos, there's a Shabbos, the seventh day, there's a Shabbos of the land. Why the use of that terminology the Rav wants to, to understand? And it's not coincidental, clearly, there's a message here. So the Rav studies very carefully, deciphers the words very carefully and tries to figure out the lessons that we can learn from Shemitah even if we're not living in Eretz Israel today, the messages are powerful. Okay, so let's start at the very opening. Pasuk Aleph is a problematic pasuk because it's the only mitzvah in the Torah that has this mention of Bahar Sinai associated with it. So you all remember Rashi, Ma Shemitah Eitzel Har Sinai, right? What Shemitah doing Bahar Sinai? In other words, why really the question that Rashi's raising is, why is this the only mitzvah that's mentioned in association with revelation? Doesn't make sense. So what does Rashi say? He gives an answer that all of the details of Shemitah, just like the details of Shemitah are enumerated in the Torah, so all of the details of the Torah in every halacha, even if it's not written here, were detailed to Moshe on Har Sinai. That's what Rashi says. The Rav says something totally different. The Rav this is my understanding of the Rav. He says, why do you start Shemitah with Har Sinai? For a very simple reason. If I tell you the laws of Shemitah, what are the laws of Shemitah? You're not to work your land for a whole year. Now you're a farmer. You depend upon agriculture. You depend on it for your own food. You depend upon it for your livelihood, right? You're feeding, you're going to, you're going to sell the produce of the land. You're not allowed to work for a whole year. Well, where am I supposed to get my livelihood from? It's a very simple question of, are you for real? You don't want me to work my land for a whole year? Not only that, what else? When it comes the 50th year, you don't want me to work for two years. 
So guess what? The Rav understands. Do you know why it introduces these mitzvot with the words Bahar Sinai? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is promising just this the same Hashem that revealed himself and gave us the Torah is the same Hashem that's telling you, you have nothing to worry about. I'm in control. You're, there's going to be a bracha. The bracha will be that the sixth year will produce enough that you will not have any worry and you're going to be fed for the sixth and the seventh year. Just keep Shemitah. Bahar Sinai. That's how the Rav understands why Shemitah is introduced with Bahar Sinai. Not like Rashi. Rashi is very famous with his shot because we learned that as children in, in school. And makes, you know, Rashi is a very important statement. You know, um, all of the details of the Torah were given to, to, to Moshe. But the Rav gets down to why Shemitah and Yovel? Why is that mentioned? Because honestly, it's the hardest mitzvah to believe it. What are you telling me not to work for a whole year? I, how do I not work for a whole year and feed my family? The Har Sinai. It's HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the well, one. Also, at Har Sinai, that's how they live. Uh, exactly. Very good. Right? We, we lived exactly. We went through the midbar with HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying there wasn't too much food in the midbar except the man HaKadosh Baruch Hu will provide. Right? That is the idea. Exactly correct. By Bahar Sinai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will provide. I think it's a very interesting way to, to understand why Bahar Sinai is mentioned by Shemitah and Yovel. Continues on into the next passage. Daber al-Bnei Yisrael b'mar What's the next two words? Daber al-Bnei b'mar ta'alehem. Ki savau el ha'aretz. What does that mean? What's ki savau el ha'aretz mean? Who's the we? Who's the the? You. Oh, who's the you? The Nei Yisrael. These two words are crucial halachically. They are very important. Based on this, the Rambam and Hilchos Trumos and Masros, Perik Aleph Halacha Chafav teaches us a very important halacha from those two words, Kizavo, that's going to have a ramification, I believe, very soon. How many Jew, you know, Yom Atzma, which is always the time where Eretz Yisrael, the, the land of Israel, they announced the census. How many Jews are living in the land? How many people are in the land? I think there were 10 million people, over 10 million people. And we're eight and a half, pretty close to eight and a half million Jews in Eretz Yisrael. Of course, you think about it. Uh, it's wild. When 1948, 75 years ago, how many were there? 600,000. Now there's eight and a half million Jews. So what does the Rambam say? When you, the plural of Klau Yisrael, when Ro B'nai Yisrael are living in Eretz Yisrael, what happens? The halachos of Chumos and Maisros and Mitzros Tluyos Ba'aretz become biblical. They become De'oraisa. They become biblically, they, they, they no longer remain rabbinic. Um, there, there are rabbinic laws of Trumos and Ma'asros, right, to this manazeh, until we have Ro B'nai Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael, it is rabbinic. Uh, Shemitah, this manazeh, until you have Ro B'nai Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael, it's a rabbinic obligation. Kisavo el Eretz, as soon as you have a majority of Jews living in Eretz Yisrael, it becomes De'oraisa. The Rav noted that this was a basis to a heter. If it's rabbinic, you have more room for, you know, flexibility, if you will. There's more latitude when it comes to halacha. So what do you think the Rav said? Oh, sure, there's more latitude. It's called heter mechira. Heter mechira. What do they do with Shemitah? They sell the land. If you're not going to be observing Shemitah in its in its strict fashion. So how do you eat the fruit grown in Eretz Israel? So the Rabbanut, back to way before Rav Kook, but Rav Kook, they, they, Rav Kook wrote the most important work on, on the Hetzer Mechira. But it was Rav Yitzchak Ochanan, in Rav Yitzchak Ochanan Specter, who was the Godel Hador in the 19th century, who paskin for the Yishuv in Eretz Israel, was a small little Yishuv, he paskin the Hetzer Mechira. So the Rav said, the Hetzer Mechira, I get it. 
how do you have a heter mechira? Only if it's the Rabbanon. Shemitah is the Rabbanon. It's the right, so you have no heter mechira. So, but he says, I don't endorse it. The Rav did not endorse it for a very interesting reason. When the Churban bias Rishon occurred, when the Beis Hamikdash, number one, was destroyed, the Kedushas Eretz Yisrael, the Gemara says, evaporated. With the Churban bias, with the destruction of it, the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael evaporated. It came back when? With the building of the second Beis Hamikdash. This is how Chazal understood it. It was returned and it was it, it, it remained. It remained. Even after the second base on Migdash was destroyed, the Rambam Paskins, no, Kedusha, um, Kedusha Lossid Lavo. It remained forever. But what did not return? What happened with the Churban Bayas Rishon? Who owned the land? Well, every Shevet had its part of the Nachala, right? Ruvain lived in a certain place. Shimon lived in Negev. Did Shimon really have part of the land? That's a whole discussion. Okay, but Levi didn't have any, right? Levi didn't have, Levi had the uh, Are Mikla. Okay, but Yehuda had its land in near Yerushalayim in that area, Binyamin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ephraim is Hare Ephraim, Arayom We know exactly where they were. Fine, All what happened with the Churban Bayes? The Nachala disappeared. Everybody's ownership of land disappeared. And that never returned. That never returned. So After remains? the yeah. Kedusha. Oh. The Kedusha remained, so, which what, becomes what a whole is, issue. What well, is the of Kedusha? Can you walk up on the bias, uh, on the Hara bias today? That, that's a whole problem. Right. Right. That, uh, so what about Kedusha Eretz Israel? Kedusha Eretz Israel. Eretz Israel. There is a Kedusha to Eretz Israel, but a good example, Allah is, is there a Kedusha on Har Habayis or not? Mm -hmm. So we said, yeah, there is Kedusha on Har Habayis. And that was the whole discussion, if people should go up to the Har Habayis or not. So they go to the mikvah, those who permit, they say, we know exactly where to walk, where not to walk. Mm -hmm. The Rabbanut was afraid that people wouldn't be strict. They would come up without going to the mikvah, they would come up and walk in the wrong places, and it could be chorus. So they didn't want it. But why would the, the mikvah be good enough? Don't you? Know yeah. The, it, 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 well, that for to go up to the harabayas, the the tumor that had to be removed was was resolved by mikvah. Okay, but you're not going because you're not going. Okay. Hopefully, kodesh hakadosh, you're not going near there. You're not allowed to go near there. So anyhow. Back to this, the Rav said, I get the Heter Mephira, but I don't endorse it because once the Churban Bayis Sheni occurred, I mean, Churban Bayis Rishon occurred, though with the building of Bayis Sheni, yes, the Kedusha returned, but the Nachala never did. Then that means who owns Eretz Yisrael? Called an entity, Klau Yisrael. Klau Yisrael owns an entity. In other words, Yehuda, we don't know where Yehuda's land. That, that's not known, owned by Yehuda. If no individual owns the land, how can you go sell it? How can you sell it from Klau Yisrael? You can't sell it from Klau Yisrael. There's no capability of transferring deed when you don't have a person who owns it transferring it. Yeah, if I own my, my house, I can sell it to you. But if I don't own my house, how do you buy it from me? That was what the Rav was concerned about. You should know there's a whole discussion based on this week's parsha, uh, which is halacha lemaase. Kisavo has two ramifications, right? We're on the cusp of this halacha changing, you know, pretty soon. Rav, La Yisrael is going to be living in Eretz Yisrael, Baruch Hashem. What? Not, not in Brooklyn? Not, like, not in Muncie like, either. Like, I'm sorry? No, I don't. I, I, don't, I didn't see late. I, the last time I saw was uh, 15 million Jews. So then you're saying that it's already it's in pretty, the pretty close. It's pretty close. That 15, I, I might be wrong. But that was a while back. I don't know what the census is. But they said it's not yet rove. It's not yet rove. But it's pretty close to it. Yeah. And so you should know from the Rambam, based on this pasuk, we have a fascinating halacha. It's in this week's parsha. Continues on. 
Shabbos Lahashem, right? And the sh- and what will the what will happen? The Shavsa Ha'aret Shabbos Lahashem. What does those words mean? The Shavsa. What Shabbos mean? Oh, rest. Is that what Shabbos mean? What does it mean? Stop. Withdrawal. Shabbos means a withdrawal. So the question that the Rav wants to know, which I started with, right, is why I get what Shabbos means every seventh day, right? We withdraw from work. Get it. Well, there's more to it. Why would you associate that with Eretz Yisrael, with Shemitah? Using the language is um, the land The land is resting or the land and, it, and it's not, it can be defiled. The Torah is teaching us a fans, fascinating phenomenon. Number one, the Rav says, Eretz Yisrael possesses a personality all of its own. It's the poetic Rabbi Soloveitchik talking. Eretz Yisrael possesses a personality all of its own. It's similar, it's similar the Rav writes, to a human being. We each have a personality. Eretz Yisrael has a personality. Just like human beings rest on Shabbos, he writes, so too the land needs to rest. The land needs to rest, not because agriculturally it needs to rest. I mean, it does benefit from that, right? You know, farmers change positions where they plant crops, right? For very good reasons. But that's not what, because the land is being compared, the Rav says, to the human being here. The Shav Sa'arit Shabbos Lashem. Eretz Yisrael is unique. That's what the Torah is telling us. Like human beings are unique. There are no two human beings alike. Guess what? There are no two lands. No land in the world compares to Eretz Yisrael. It has its unique personality. So what's, what does the Torah tell us? V'shei shanim tizra sodecha. And in Pasuk Gimel, right? V'shei shanim tizra sodecha. And for six years, you may sow your field. The Rav noted in these words, we are being taught that a man has a right to use the vet- vegetation, to use the plant for his benefit. What does that mean? Six years, God is permitting us to eat the plant world, isn't he? Clearly, this means we're allowed to kill plants. Plants grow. Why, why are we allowed to kill plants? Why do we call that murder? Right? <laughs> to a certain degree. It, no, Akadosh, because Hakadosh Baruch Hu permits it. He understands that this is the message. This is the means of our nourishment. Yet there is a moral lesson involved in this as well. Man must realize his ownership of the plant world is limited. He never acquires an absolute ownership. They belong to Hashem, who grants us the privilege. Shmita and Yovel teach us. We're not the owners. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's the owner. You can, you can eat the plant world. You can kill the plants for what you need. You need them to, you need them for dyes. You need whatever you need. You can use them, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, but you're not the owner. You're not the total owner. I'm lending it to you, if you will. I'm a lease level. And that's what Shemitah and Yovel teach us. Shemitah and Yovel have a powerful message. Who Hashem Ha'aretz? The world is God's, and he's lending it to you to use. Let's continue on. So then it says, The Rav wonders why the rest of the land is referred to with the same terminology of Shabbos. So we answered one, right? It's, he said it's not coincidental. So we answered one point is that it has a uniqueness. Land has uniqueness. But there's a second point. When man keeps Shabbos, what does he do? When man keeps, when we keep Shabbos, what are we doing? We're declaring our belief. That's correct. So then Hashem is not only the creator, but the owner. The owner. That is crucial. That's why Shemitah is called Shabbos Lashem. When man keeps Shabbos, he testifies that Hashem not only created the world, but Hashem is the owner. In other words, Hashem, Hashem decides who owns what. When one violates Shabbos, he's considered, what do we call him, the Chalal Shabbos? I remember Rabbi Soloveitchik saying, there are, yeah, there are Shemesh Shabbos in America. There's no Friday Jew in America. That's what he used to, he wrote that in, in uh, 
his, uh, he said it in his uh, Tshuva Drushas. He says, I've met Shemi Shabbos in America, but I've never met a Friday Jew in America. A Friday Jew I knew in Europe. Friday Jew was a Jew who was getting excited that Shabbos was coming. That I didn't meet in America. That Friday Jew is the person who already sets his table Thursday night and is excited that Shabbos is coming. Shabbos is coming. Wow. He says that was an experience he felt was palatable, he said, in the streets in Europe. And the shtetls in Europe, it was just palatable. But Shabbos was coming. You knew it. In America, yeah, they keep it. But they're running into the, they're running up until, dot, 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 dot. right? No, that's not, that's not, uh, that was not the European Jew. But in other words, what's, what's a Shabbos Jew? A Shabbos Jew. Why is it so important? We say, if you're not, if you're not a Shemesh Shabbos, we don't trust you for Edus. We don't trust you for anything, right? We don't. We, we don't trust a person uh, on the Chal of Shabbos. We don't trust. Uh, he has no Naamonis. Why? What's the Naamonis lost? Because he's demonstrating or she's demonstrating no belief that Hashem is the creator and owner of the world. This very same motif applies to Shemitah. By stopping working the land once in seven years and then twice with Yovel and Shemitah and Yov together, what are you demonstrating? God is the authority. God is the owner of the universe. We're here only by the grace of God. That's the only reason we're here. We have permission to work the land. True, you can work it for your own benefit, but this does not suggest that you become owners. You're not the owners. Our Kodesh Baruch is the owner. Ownership remains in the hands of Hashem. Shabbos by definition means, I said the withdrawal, the Rav uses a different expression. You know what Shabbos is? A surrendering, a surrendering to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Shabbos la Hashem. You surrender the ownership to God. I understand. Gashmias is not unlimited. Gashmias is limited. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the owner. Can I ask yes, I please. Maybe that's right about Shabbat. It's so important, but we say with Samachta Bechagecha, we never say with Samachta Bechabatecha. Right? Right? Simcha is not applicable to Shabbos. Oneg and Kavod is applicable to Shabbos. Simcha is Yontif. Simcha is a whole different concept. I mean, uh, Yontif is a whole different concept. Who we talked about this last week. Who defines, who declares Yontif? Kla yeah. Yisrael, Sanhedrin, right? Right? Nekadesh Yisrael Vahazmanim. We talked about beautifully last week the Rishalmi and the Bavli, right? The Rishalmi and the Bavli. The Rishalmi says, even by Shabbos, you mentioned Yisrael, right? Mekadesh HaShabbos Yisrael. Mekadesh Yisrael HaShabbos. Right, that's the Rishami. So the Rav says, how do we resolve that? We, we know Yontif, we declare Yontif. We have to declare the new month. 15 days later is Pesach. 15 day, t- uh, 10 days later is Yom Kippur, right? Depending upon the month. All wonderful. Yisrael Vahazmanin. Oh, Shabbos? Shabbos comes no matter what we do. Now, so the Rav pointed out, if you remember, there is a component to Shabbos that requires man, which is what? Tosefes Shabbos. There's a halacha called Tosefes Shabbos. You're to start Shabbos, you, you light your licht when? 18 minutes before Shabbos. In Eretz Yisrael, in Yerushalayim, 45 minutes, right? In Tel Aviv, I don't know, 35. Every city in Eretz Yisrael has its own minig. Haifa, Tel Aviv, Yerushalayim, everybody, I think Yerushalayim is the most machmir. Yerushalayim is 45 minutes before Shkia. They're already taking on Shabbos. And we don't, we're, we're machmir to worrying about Shabbos at the end of Shabbos. Seis HaKolchovim is not so pushed, right? The, the Rav waited 90 minutes, Motsoi Shabbos. 90 minutes, not the 70, everybody thinks. Rabbeinu Tam, 72, the Rav, had a shita of 90 minutes. He would not stop, he would not stop Shabbos until 90. He would not get into a car until 90 minutes after Shabbos. That's Tosefa Shabbos. What's Tosefa Shabbos? There can be no Tosefa Shabbos if man doesn't have a role. It should be sunset to sunset, right? It should be natural. No, that's the component that the Rav explained. But okay, let's continue on. I feel that's what they call Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
take a look at Pasuk Ches now. This, so far, this is a compl complicated Pasuk. You tell me what's problematic in this Pasuk. This so far to lecha sheva shabasos, shanim, sheva shanim, sheva famim. What does that mean? And you shall count for yourself what? Seven years, seven cycles of seven years. That's going to get you how many seven years? If you count seven years seven times, how much are you going to get? Very good. You took out your calculator. Very good. Continue on in the Pasuk. Just in case you didn't take out your calculator, I'll tell you how much it is. It's 49. What's the repetition? Right? There is a lot of repetition here. There's, if you're told, count seven Shemitah seven times, I know it's 49. The Torah doesn't have to tell me 49. That's the problem. So why, why mention this? Yeah, totally. So did you ever think we couldn't count, right? So the Rav points out, the Torah is teaching you the significance of counting. And the significance of counting is as follows. The Torah is teaching us how we count is crucial. Not that we count. How we count is crucial. 49 years comprising Yovo were not part of a progression. Each which loses, what's a progression? One, two, it, 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 God bless you. It, it, if it's a progression, as soon as I get to the second level of the progression, the first level is forgotten. I got a progression, progression going up to what? 49. And the 49 is only what counts. The building up the 48 steps to the 49 don't count if it's a progression. I just need to reach the goal. That's one way, right? Rather, each year, no, we're told it has an independent significance. The 49 years are cumulative. It's not a progression, it's cumulative. Each year of the 49 remain, retains its own identity. The Rav notes that this means when you're counting Shemitah towards Yovel, you know how you have to count? One, two, three, one year, two year, three year, four year, five year. My nafkamina, that is called, and I had to do some research because I didn't know the difference. That's called cardinal numbers. Cardinal numbers are one, two, three, four. Then you have, that's an ordinal number. You know what an ordinal number is? It's associated with the number before and the number after. It's the first, the second. What's the first associated? That means this, the first, there's going to be a second. The second, there's going to be a third, correct? It's an associated. It's not one. One means what? One means, that's cardinal. It means one is one is one, not associated with any else. Two is two is two. Each one has its own identity. When you say Yom Rishon, Yom Shani, Yom Shlishi, what is that telling me? How do you count? Hayom Yom, Shir Shal Yom. How, you, how do you do it? Hayom Yom, Rishon. Hayom Yom, yes, today is Hayom Yom Rivi'i. But what does that tell you? It's a progression to what? So do I care about Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or do I care about Shabbos? Once you get to Shabbos, who cares about Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday have no impact on the Shabbos once you get to Shabbos. Has no cont continuity. But if you count one, two, three, four, each one has an independence. Shemitah and Yovel have an independence. Tremendous Musr. How do you count Sfiras HaOmer? Echad. You do not say Rishon. Hayom Yom Echad. Hayom Yom Hayom Sheni. Hayom Shlishi, right? Hayom Shloshim Arba, right? Right? Sfiras Omer are cardinal or ordinal? No, cardinal. Cardinal. I, again, I was not a, I was not a bucky on this at all. I had to do my research. No, Sfiras Omer, and I, I, I asked for Chama. I'm right. I asked you, do you know the difference between cardinal and ordinal? So she said to me, do you know? I said, I have no idea. So she said, don't teach it unless you know it. So I did a little research. Cardinal. Yeah. yeah, so cardinal and ordinal are two different types of counting. Cardinal is one, two, three, four, five. And each one has its own independent personality, if you will, own value. Ordinal 
means you progress. There's a progression. The first, the second, there's an order. That's right. But once you get to the goal, who cares about the previous? That's Shmita. We care. Every day that's counted is a step closer to Shavuos. Every day is one step, two steps, and each step is important. And that's what I told you from Haktav Kabbalah last week. The Safarta Lachem, right? By last week in Parshas Emor, I quoted the Kav Kabbalah and Shul. I said Kav Kabbalah says the um, uh, operative word by Sfirah Saomer in that Pasuk was Lachem. Count that it should change your life. It means what? What does that mean? Every day should count. Every day. The lesson is every Kabbalistic each week is a different. Yes, yeah, that's how the Kabbalistic. How did the Kabbalist? How did the Kabbalist get that? How did the Muhammad? How did the Kabbalist get it? Now you know, right? Because it's that's and the Rav says that's what's being taught to you that the numbers, the forty nine up to Yovel each year is special. Today is day one. Today is it's an accumulation yeah. of 49 years. Yeah. We've lost count on the Yovel. Why? How did we lose count? I don't know. But how does that work even till today with the 50th yeah. year? So we just do 49, 49, 49, 49. Yeah. We, we stop do doing Yovel. We stop do doing Yovel. When, when, when the Mashiach comes. Yeah. Mashiach comes. Count. I don't know why we lost Yovel. I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I can't. Uh, I, I admit my ignorance on this. I always wondered also, and I should do more research. How did Yovel, how did we lose Yovel? We should be able to count Yovel. Are you saying that well, it's because of rabbinic? Well, it is rabbinic. Know, until we get to Teretz Israel, it's rabbinic. I mean, until we get Rov Teretz Israel, so the Rambam says, there, maybe, I don't know. We, I think there was, I think my gut, I have to test this, is that is a component of Zecher of Lechurban. We don't have Eretz Israel like we had. And therefore, we're not going to continue like we had. But, you know, the whole issue, and it's fascinating. I get scared when Shemitah comes. I don't know about you. I get scared. Well, that, that, those are halachas are like really out of my domain. You know, Shumas and Maishas are out of my domain. I, I remember Rav Kook, he just passed away a few months ago. Rav Kook of Rehobo was a guest when we first moved to LA. And I remember he took the orange that we gave him. He asked for an orange. He took an orange. And he says, this orange, it doesn't have a kippah. Yeah. I go, what? Yeah, he says, the Neretz Yisrael orange has a kippah. It's Shemitah, it's Chumas, and Maizris. It has alochos. This one, I just have to make a brach on it. That's all, right? Chutzlar, it's fruit, doesn't have a kippah. That's true. Eretz Yisrael has, you know, all of these halochos are now really, not only like complicated, but they're, they're coming back to life. There's a whole area. Allah Lamaisa, because we have a Medina in Israel. It's unbelievable. It's a beautiful thing. Right? Shemitah and Yoko, all this. Anyhow, that's what the Rav points out is being taught in this puzzle. Continue on, puzzle test. And then what? Oh, this is a fascinating puzzle. The Avarta Shofar Chua Bachodash Ashmi. And you know, we do this, it's a minute we do every year. Motsoi Yom Kippur, we blow the Shofar. So most associated with to remember the Yovel blowing, right? We blew the Yovel on the Motsoi Yom Kippur. We blow the Yovel, uh, the Shofar on Yovel. What's the halacha? Pay close attention. It's different than halacha of Shofar on Rosh Hashanah. The, the rough notes. Yeah. No, Vahavarta. What does Vahavarta mean? Yeah, well, Listen to the Rambam. The Rambam in Hilchus Shmita v'Yovel Halacha Perak Yud Halacha Yud, and I'll read it in translation. It is a positive biblical commandment, mitzvah sasei min haTorah, on the tenth of Tishrei, which is Yom Kippur, in the Yovel year. Pay close attention to the words of the Rambam. To blow the shofar. Every individual is obligated to blow. Those are the words of the Rambam. What is that? That is totally different than 
the halacha in Hilchos Shofar by Rosh Hashanah. In Hilchos Shofar, Perak Aleph, Halacha Aleph, the Rambam writes, it is a positive biblical commandment, this is, I say, in HaTorah, to hear the Shofar blast on Rosh Hashanah. Do I have to blow it myself? No. I can listen to Dr. Wilner blow the Shofar, Dr. Elspas, blow the Shofar. I fulfill my mitzvah, correct? I can hear the Shofar from the somebody else. On Rosh Hashanah, it's the mitzvah, Lishmoa kol shofar, isn't that the bracha? Lishmoa kol shofar. To hear the, what about on the mitzvah on the Yovel? On that Yom Kippur and Yovel, everybody had to blow. I don't know what you do if you don't know how to blow, but everybody has to blow. Not one person blowing, everybody has to blow. And it's different, the Rav notes, that there's a halachic differential between Rosh Hashanah and Yovel. Yovel, everybody blew. Now, there's a fascinating, now the, the Rav gets into halacha, there's a fascinating halacha. Am I allowed to use a lulav hagazel, a stolen lulav to be mekayim the mitzvah of Arba Minim? No, you're not allowed to use a item that is stolen to perform a mitzvah. Okay. What about a shofar? Am I allowed to use a shofar to blow the shofar on Yom Kippur, uh, on, on Rosh Hashanah? Am I allowed to use the shofar to blow? So the halacha says yes, because you can't steal sound. What's the mitzvah? The shmoa kol shofar. You're, it's not endorsing it, but if you did it, if you stole a shofar and you blew it, have you performed it? If I took a lulav and an esro and I stole it, I, I, no, you, you haven't been making anything because it's a stolen item and the, the item you're shaking, you're using it, you're doing a pu'ula, an act with it. You can't do something with a stolen item. But what about hearing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah? So the halacha says, you can't steal sound. How do you steal sound? How, how, how do you do that? You can't steal sound. It's not the record company saying so you can steal sound. Well, that's something a little, little different. That's still just the record. It's the record. Stealing the vehicle. Oh, right. Instrument. Right. right. Something illegally, you are stealing. That's sound. interesting. You're, you're uh, well, but you can't steal sound. You can't but, steal but sound. You can't it's impossible to steal sound. So the halacha says, hey, can you, if you, if some, if the Baal Tokea took a chauffeur that wasn't his and he blew it, and we heard the shofar. Were we Mekayim the mitzvah? The halacha says, yes, you were. You were Mekayim the mitzvah. It doesn't endorse it, but you were Mekayim the mitzvah. The bottom line, what's the law? The law in court, you were, you fulfilled the mitzvah. What about on Yovel? No, because why? That's what the rope points out. Blow. Everybody has to blow. The mitzvah isn't hearing. The mitzvah is to do what? I got it. I need an instrument. And the instrument is stolen. And I can't do it. No. In other words, Rav notes that there's a halachic different differential between Rosh Hashanah and the shofar on Yom Kippur of Yovel. I thought that was fascinating. Okay. Continue on. Jump to Pasuk of Gimel. And this is what it's talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, 100%. Okay. And the land shall not be sold permanently. That's one of the halachos. So we get Shemitah. What is Shemitah? You don't work the land. What is Yovel? Yovel is not only that you don't work the land, but the land goes back to its owner. Perpetuity in sales doesn't occur when Eretz Yisrael is, uh, is being uh, referred to. Well, no, so yeah. Kodesh Baruch who gave us, gave Yehuda this Nachalah, gave Ephraim this Nachalah, gave Ruven this Nachalah, everybody gets their land. But after the, he said that. Right, well, we, the, the Rav pointed out that that was, uh, that element no longer exists. Right? Okay. So this the rough. These are the words that community uses against the Yeah. Loads. Right, right. There's, 
the Rav notes the idea of not selling one's portion in Eretz Yisrael permanently isn't limited to this Pasuk, right? Pasuk Chav Gimel? No. We already were introduced the idea in an earlier Pasuk. Go back to Pasuk Yud Gimel. A person shall go back to his land. It's repeated like twice. Here we are told you shall return each man to his ancestral heritage. Rashi explained that to mean the restoration of the land that had been sold by its original owner. The restoration of the, that's the first post. Your gimel is the restoration of the land. It was the original owner is going to regain the ownership. Our Pasuk teaches us the prohibition of selling. That's Pasuk Yugimel. It goes back to its owner. Pasuk Chav Gimel, there is an Easter. There is a prohibition in the Torah to sell Eretz Yisrael in perpetuity. It is not sold in perpetuity. The aloha of not selling the land of Eretz Yisrael in perpetuity involves two halachic concepts. This is real brisker Torah. This is real Salavachic Torah. Listen. On the one hand, there's what the Salavachics call chovas agavra. What does that mean? The obligation that applies to people. Gavra is a person. In this case, the seller and the buyer. There's a halacha that deals with them, the seller and the buyer. A duty falls on both, that the land of Israel is not to be sold by anybody and not to be purchased by anybody in perpetuity. But there's another component that the Torah is telling us, and that's a halacha called chovas hachefsa. What's chovas hachefsa? The item itself is obligated not to be sold, making such a sale invalid. If you did it, it's invalid because the land itself just does not take hold in that sale. It's pro prohibited. The land you cannot do that. If you do that, it is not a sale that has any legs to stand on, if you will. It has no validity. The first pasuk in Yud Gimel is the reference to our ancestral heritage, right? It goes back to the original. That, he says, is a chovas hachefsa, the obligation in the land. The, what this means is that a Jew must show special respect to the land of Eretz Yisrael. These laws are showing respect to this by religious obligation. Must one must return to his unique bond? Each person had their ancestral piece of land. They must return to their unique bond with Eretz Israel. They may not sell that unique bond to anyone else. That's why the land cannot be sold in perpetuity. Because if you did, you would not be demonstrating your bond with Eretz Israel which would be a disrespect of the land of Eretz Yisrael. Remember, we pointed out, the Rav said, the land of Eretz Yisrael has a personality. You can't disrespect it like you can't disrespect the person. But then there's our Pesach. Our Pesach is a financial halacha. It's a financial legal halacha. This verse focuses on, he says, human sensibilities. A person has a right to keep his connection with the land of Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, the land cannot be sold in a fashion where a person loses that connection. That's a financial connection to the land. There is their perpetuity, that's Chofas HaGavra, and then there's the Chofas HaGavra, the person, and the person can return to his land. So two different Chovos, the Rav is noting, pointing out. There's a land obligation, and it will have ramifications. If you do this, you sell land in perpetuity. Is that a sale? No. Nope. Not when it comes to Eretz Yisrael. You just simply can't do it. There's no validity to it. Finally, the Rav notes, the last thing I want to point out, he says in Pesach Chav Gimel, Ki Geirim Shavim Atem Imadi. What's Ki Geirim Shavim Atem Imadi? For you are Geirim, he quotes it, he says in translation, you are sojourners. What's a sojourner? Temporary. Temporary. And residence with me. This, the Rav says, teaches us a moral lesson. Man has no unconditional ownership of anything in life. You don't have an unconditional ownership. God is not only the creator of the universe. We go back to where we started, right? Shabbat taught, taught us that. 
And the Rav says the Torah is repeating that very important moral lesson that the universe is not owned by us. The universe is owned by Hashem. The status of man in this world is best defined as a tenant and a sharecropper. Gerim v'toshavim. You're a, shen, share, a tenant and a sharecropper at best. And this is the very idea of Shabbos. And that's, again, why the Torah refers to Shemitah and Yovo by the terms Shabbat, Shabbaton. The Torah demands us, remember where we started. What did I tell you Shabbat means? A withdrawal, a surrender. It surrenders the material possessions to Hashem, if you will, right? Rather, we must remember we're managing someone else's land. We're here managing God's land, right? Shabbos means that withdrawal. It's a delusion to believe that we're the owners. And that's what Shabbos and Shemitah and Yovo are all teaching us. A cant, a, a re repeat, we have it every seven days. We have it every seven years. We have it every 49, 50 years. The reminder, because man has to be reminded, hey, you don't own it. You might have a big bank account, but that bank account you don't own, right? Well, the failing of the banks remind us that too, right? Okay. But we think, we think that we own it. So the weekly Shabbos and the, week, and the yearly Shemitah acknowledge that Hashem is the master of the world. So where, where do we begin and where do we end? The Rav wanted to know what the lessons of Shemitah and Yovel are. And first he pointed out why does it start? Why is the words Bahar Sinai associated with Shemitah and Yovel? Why does it introduce this halacha, these halachos with that expression? And the answer is because, as you pointed out, Linda, just like in, our, just like in Sinai and Sinai, HaKadosh Baruch who had to feed us, He'll feed us with Shemitah and Yovo too. He'll take care of us. That's the promise. It's a promise to remove the anxiety, if you will. Now I'm going to teach you all about Shemitah and you're going to go, oh, you got to be, are you for real? Do you want me not to work my land? Right? Yeah, I want you not to work your land. That's right. Why? For the moral lesson to teach us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the owner of the world and we expect you to do, why is it called Shabbos? Because Shabbat la, la Aretz, why? Because it's a withdrawal, a surrender, a surrender of control. the control. Exactly. That's what, exactly what the, the Sukim are teaching us. I have throughout. a question. If yeah. I may. The end of this Pasuk is a little bit clear to me. And I don't quite understand if you can help me out. Because it says here, which I understand. The Geula comes from God. It's not something that we can make the Geula. We can maybe pray, we can make the Geula. No, Geula, Geula can be. No, Geula doesn't mean only a redemption on a metaphysical fashion. Geula means very simple, not just like Shabbos means a withdrawal. Geula means the opposite. Right? You're going to now, you're going to have a connection with it. It's going to be redeemed to your ownership. It's an ownership concept. The land is going to be returned to its correct owner, its original owner. So when we buy a house here, to buy land, and we buy a house in Israel, are you buying the land or are you? Uh, well, at the time of the Torah, in the time of when we were, when we, we had Nachala, you were just buying the house. So yeah. now, though, so, in, in contemporary, if you buy a house in Israel, are you buying the house or the land? No, uh, no the, the, this, this, it, first of all, it, this no longer applies because we don't have, a, we don't have Nachala, right. right? We don't have so Shvatim. Again well, happen. no, but you'd have to have Nahala again. You'd have to have uh, the tribes, each one having its its territory, and then you have to figure out which shape that you're from. If I'm not right? mistaken, and we don't if, know. If I'm not mistaken, in Israel, all the land actually is under beside God. I know God owns yeah, yeah. everything, but Karen Kayemit in every 
uh, papers that you yeah. have on the property in Israel, yeah, yeah. it says Karen Akayemi is the owner and you only own it for 99 years. Yeah, then it starts really, again. I, I thought yeah, the long-term leases are very yeah. common. It's mm -hmm. 99 well, years. Well, supposedly right? they have the problem with a lot of land. Yeah, it's a lot of the churches. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I don't know how it works. Yeah. You'd have to ask a real estate person. Okay. Thank you. Next Thank week, you. we'll not have a share. Oh, okay. uh, no, next week, uh, we'll not. I don't think the next two weeks. Let's see what happens right after Shavuos. Okay. Yeah. But before Shavuos, no. 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 It we won't happen. We shall sell Yes.